Hey everybody, it's Susan Lindner. I'm your host with Innovation Storytellers. Today is going to be a great conversation. I hope you are putting on your mortar board. I hope you are ready to move your tassel from left to right. We are having a conversation about innovation on many different levels, at the corporate level, at the personal level, as we learn and grow, and at the academic level. And really excited to think about innovation in a different way today with my guest, Steve Rubinell. Now, if you don't know Steve, you should, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him. He has been, as his industry peers like to say, he is clearly one of the most innovative and transformational CIOs ever. An exceptional multifaceted global executive strategist and technology expert who has transformed companies in a variety of industries, including the New York Stock Exchange, for one. He is the award-winning Chief Information and Technology Officer with deep experience on boards and in university classrooms. Steve brings a multidisciplinary perspective and imagination to transforming industries from the bottom up in complex and highly competitive industries. He is a visionary leader who often breaks free of conventional thinking and encourages others to do the same with creative, innovative strategies. Allow me to welcome Professor Steve Rubinow to Innovation Storytellers. Welcome. <laughs> I hope I did you justice there, Steve. Oh, it's, it sounds great. So, you know, I always start the show in, in the same vein, which is how the heck did you get here? How did you get into innovation? Because no one has a straight path to taking this route. How did you get there? Yeah, you know, Susan, that's a great question, and people ask it all the time. Of, of me and people uh, like me, it's like, how did you get to where you were? Because it doesn't seem like there's a way to get from here to there. Mm. And I, I agree with that, because if you had told me when I was in college that I would end up doing what I'm doing now or some of the things along the way, I would say, how is that possible? I don't see how you can connect those dots. But uh, I can tell you that when I was in college, I was studying to be a, a chemist, and I got a PhD in chemistry. And then I thought, as I'm always thinking about the next move, I was thinking, how, how can I make myself more well-rounded? I'm pretty I'm much focused on science and analytics and the technology that supports the science, but I don't understand enough about how business works because I never had a reason to. So I went and got an MBA. And in, in the course of getting that MBA, I found that I liked business more than I thought. And that because I approached business problems like a scientist, that I had a, a kind of a view into these problems that other people might not have, a more analytic, a more inquiring, a more challenging approach, perhaps, that I think a lot of people grounded in science uh, might have. And as it turned out, instead of following my, my chemistry route, which I still is a subject I'm still passionate about today, uh, I started, I, I followed a technology route because technology, again, I, as a scientist, I use it every day. So mm -hmm. I'm uh, to it. And I thought maybe in a corporate setting, maybe I can add some unique value. And also I understood as a technologist, I probably had broader career opportunities as opposed to specializing in a very specialized field, which again, could have been very rewarding, but I felt I wanted to have more options and I thought technology would do it. So that kind of started me on my journey of going through kind of a corporate route as opposed to a traditional research chemist or academic route. You know, and... It's funny because oftentimes people find much later in their career that, you know, after running their head against the wall several times that that business knowledge, right, that acumen would have been so helpful as they move their way up the chemistry ranks at DuPont or BASF, you know, BASF that, oh, I actually need some negotiating skills at the boardroom table when I'm trying to get my projects approved. I'm really trying to understand deep budgets and what does that allocation look like? I'm trying to understand what EBITDA means, right? And PE ratios and all those good things that also don't come with those who have an inclination for innovation necessarily. But we're all subject to creative constraints and budget is just one of those creative constraints. That's right. And a lot of us have great ideas. There's no shortage of great ideas, I would say. But I think as we all know, in the innovation um, uh, timeline, Implementing those, first of all, sorting out those great ideas for the ones you really should pursue, because to your point, you don't have unlimited time, you don't have unlimited capital, you don't have unlimited people. So you've got to pick and choose. And finding ways to pick and choose those and separate the great ideas from the just good ones is hard. And not everybody can do it because 
they feel, well, I have a good idea. Of course it's worth pursuing, but is it really? Is it really worth pursuing? Is the, are, are the economic uh, incentives there, the cost benefit, are they really where we need to have them? Is the value pro proposition great enough? Do you really think that others are going to see it the same way you do? And you've got to be able to uh, carry that forward and make other people see what you see or uh, switch, switch horses and go to something that's more uh, promising. And, and not everyone has an appreciation for that. They just think, if I have a good idea, of course, everyone's going to see it and they're going to want to do it immediately. And they don't realize the, the competition uh, of uh, other good ideas. And you have, to pick, you have to try and pick the absolute winners from the ones that just sound good. Right. And that is, that's the role of that CEO to make those decisions, right? As he's being presented with idea after idea after idea across every department. And so, of course, in, you know, in my mind, the best story wins. So, <laughs> but I want to, I want to go back to a different part of your career where the thought of innovating, the daunting task of innovating the New York Stock Exchange and turning that from an analog machine with lots of digital components into a true digitally transformed organization is, is daunting to say the least. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you are going up against steep history, very powerful moneyed concerns, a desire for speed that is second to none on the planet. And not to mention there are, I, I, you know, having read a lot about this transformation and watching it just as, you know, as someone who's seen the history of the stock exchange, um, there's even a lot of, I would say, like nervousness about this is a place where fortunes are made in one every day and screwing with the system. I'm, I'm lost for the word of like the fear of stepping out into something new. Like we all have our own beliefs about how stories, how these stories kind of take us through our day to day. Like there are good luck charms and talismans and everything else that you would think about it, your own little tribal society within the stock exchange that screwing with any one of those things, you know, seems like it, fortunes could be made or lost on those, those feelings or, or rituals, let's say. Um, and I know from my experience of just walking around the New York Stock Exchange, I can still remember when there was one bathroom for women on the floor that I was on on the New York Stock Exchange. And that's only because it was converted from the cloakroom. Mm -hmm. One stall, one stall for women. So like you're talking about a very storied historical place. I'm happy to go back now and see there's lots of them, but it certainly was not the case. So with that, tell us about like the before at the New York Stock Exchange. What was that like? And, and some of the systems that you were working on at the time. So the, the, the his, so first of all, the, the New York Stock Exchange started in the late 1700s. So that's, it has a couple of centuries of history. Very few companies or organizations we talk about today have that kind of uh, timeline. Right. And, um, and the way I came there was, and, and as you said, uh, in the middle of last century, uh, there was a lot of paper going around. We see all the pictures, you know, traders waving their hands and sending signals and having lots of conversations. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, the floor was covered with paper and somebody had to sweep it up and start again the next day. And of course, like every other institution of that type, they, they automated over time. And, and did, the, did a pretty good job of what they did. And what happened to change everything was in the late 1900s. Boy, that sounds like such a long time ago. But the, I know, the late 1900s? In the <laughs> 1990s, I'll make it even more specific. <laughs> was something that changed the course of uh, the capital markets in the United States for, for, forever, or at least for the foreseeable future, was regulations changed. And what it did is it allowed trading to become more competitive. And so, and I won't go into the, the, the details of how the regulations changed, but a few companies started at that time. I happened to be part of one of them uh, called Archipelago uh, started in Chicago and they saw kind of the tea leaves and they, and the people who started that company could see around the corner and had a good idea for the future. Of course, as you know, anytime you start a company, it's always uh, risky and you never know how it's going to turn out. But if you, if you really believe in your idea, and this is the true encapsulation, you're willing to stick a lot uh, to, to make that a dream a reality. And in a, a few short years, because we were using 
technology that was a year or two old as opposed to much older. And we had an idea of where the markets could go as opposed to in, in every technologist talks about legacy systems and technical debt. We had none of that. We were starting with a clean sheet of paper and mm. everything that I've done. And, and of course my, my colleagues as well, we're really good at asking not uh, what have we done and how can we improve it slightly, but rather what's the art of the possible? What is the ultimate thing that we could achieve barring only the laws of physics from stopping us from going any further? And let's talk about how we might do that. So and that opportunity for like blue sky thinking, as we call it now, is is so rare, right? I mean, there are a couple of people like the Elon Musks of the world who are taking those moonshot ideas. But can you talk to us a little bit about the the imperative that was happening? And when did it begin to feel like an imperative as opposed to we could be throwing paper scraps in the air forever? Oh, well, it's the, the, the big transition went from not the, the paper era had already passed. The big transition was floor trading, the New York Stock Exchange, but also, you know, many other exchanges around the world where people talk to people to do trades. Yes, there was some electronic trading going on in the background, but mostly it was people talking to people to do trades. And for any of us that understand, you know, automation and the power of automation, we know that computers, whether we like them or not, they can do things a lot faster and more efficiently than humans can. And so this, this regulatory change that took place in the last 90s, in the late 90s, kind of opened up the possibility of doing more pure electronic trading with computers talking to computers and disintermediating the human a person in the middle. Because anything that that human could do, the computers could do faster, better, and cheaper. Mm-hmm. And that was the beginning. Uh, and as they say, the exchanges, some of the bigger exchanges were slow to react again, not only New York Stock Exchange, but other exchanges as well saying, yeah, we, we see something going on there, but we're the established leaders in our industry. And we expect that to be uh, true for a long time. But because of regulatory changes, because of te- advances in technology and because of new competitors coming into the field, because of this door that was open because of those first two things, things started to change fairly. And they weren't, it wasn't going at, at, at a geological speed. It was going almost at light speed. And so there needed to be a reaction to that because these, I'll call them upstarts, which I happen to be belong to, were making a big dent in what was going on. In fact, in a handful of years, we became the second largest stock exchange in the United States after the New York Stock Exchange. They had a 200 year head start on us. And because of all these innovation and smart people working diligently, to take advantage of all the things that the current environment afforded, we we're make, able to make huge inroads. So the New York Stock Exchange decided that in order to kind of take a jump start into the future, it was more advantageous for them rather than invent it themselves and try and, and get themselves to where they needed to go, they decided to acquire us. And when they acquired us in 2006, our, many of our management team became the management team of the exchange. It was, it was a mix. And one of the reasons that they did that was number one, that they wanted to incorporate our technology because it was designed for the high-speed trading that you were talking about. Mm-hmm. We, we count every nanosecond, every nanosecond counts. There are very few industries where they count nanoseconds, but in high-frequency trading, nanose- nanoseconds make a difference. And as I explained to people, one rule that we always remember is it takes light one nanosecond to travel one foot. And how many people care about that? Not too many, but the people in high-frequency trading care about how long those wires are because every foot is a nanosecond. And so they, and they, so they wanted us for the technology and they also wanted us to change the culture, help change the culture of this 200 year old institution into something faster paced, more entrepreneurial, all that sort of stuff. And so it, it, that's a big challenge, right? Changing anyone's culture is a big challenge, especially one that was just so entrenched in such a fine institution for such a long time. So it's hard to move the needle, but you have to move it because if you don't, other people will start to run past you and playing a game of catch up is no fun. So that, that was an important charter. And by the way, I, I want to remind everyone, this is a heavily regulated industry. And so you have to also talk to the regulators because regulators don't like things moving in light speed because they want to make sure everything, uh, the, the charter of the SEC is to maintain fair and orderly markets. And if things move too quick, in spite of all the technological opportunities, they, they want to make sure that they have um, their, their finger on the pulse as opposed to things getting a little bit too fast and then they're playing catch up. And so you have to talk to the regulators too and say to them, we're going to put our foot on the gas pedal a little bit more. It's for the good of the industry. It's for the good of our institution, but the industry in general, it will benefit all the markets and we will do so 
in a prudent fashion. And we will keep you informed every step along the way. So if you have any concerns, you can tell us and we'll adjust them if we need to. But we're going to move at a pace that the institution wasn't used to before. And they didn't have to move at that pace because they had they essentially had a huge portion of market share. So right. they were in the speed of the market. That was all changing in a very short period of time. So it called for a new response to how you compete with other exchanges, you know, whether it be NASDAQ or, or foreign exchanges, because uh, there's obviously a lot of international securities trading. And so, and how do you respond to that? And, and, do, and you have to do it very, very well. As Susan as I used to explain to people at the exchange, we had a goal of three zeros. And by that, I meant our customers expected us to provide the service at zero cost, you know, approximately zero cost, zero latency, and zero downtime. Not best two out of three, but you have to be as cheap as possible, you have to be as fast as possible, and you have to be as reliable as possible, all at the same time. And by the way, you have to provide the proper functionality, you have to be secure, all those sorts of things. And if you don't do it, someone else will, and your customers will go there in a heartbeat. Their algorithms will find that somebody else's trading venue is better than yours, and they'll reroute their orders there uh, in the blink of an eye. And you don't want that to happen. So you've got to do it all the time. So how, how much do you think the rise of like, you know, the dot-com era and our familiarity and our access to tech was also part of this phenomenon, you know, that obviously the technology simply arises, right? And at an enterprise level, you can, you know, we all went from on-premise databases, right, to um, access databases and then SQL databases and then, you know, Oracle and Salesforce and things like that. We can see that progression kind of happening, but, you know, how much of it was also, you know, traders around you and just the culture of tech arising that the expectation shifted? Well, so culturally, so you make an excellent point here. And there was two trajectories. There's a trajectory that the exchange was on, which is embracing everything you described. So they went from, again, you know, that classic paper model from the middle of last century to more automation, lots of big, redundant, reliable computers uh, they had uh, because they wanted to make sure they never had an issue. That was very important. Mm -hmm. right? and, and then they had, uh, when you see any of the pictures of the exchange floor, you see lots of terminals and lots of prices and lots of screens. Uh, so there's information flowing that everyone needs all times. And when, as people are walking around the floor, they're carrying handheld devices, you know, pre, uh, way before the iPad that were designed specifically for the need of that had long battery life were ergonomically satisfactory in terms of weight, in terms of uh, uh, screen interaction, user interface. And so they embraced all those things. But the, the, the limitation was that the human was still in the middle of that. It was trying to enhance the abilities of the human. And that's where the, the bottleneck arose because the humans could only go so fast. And so when the newer wave of technology, and by the way, a lot of the technology we're talking about for high-speed training, it's not like you could go, you could buy it. You had to invent it. We had to write ourselves because people were not producing software that operated at these speeds with these low variance in, in terms of response times with this level of reliability. It's just, there wasn't a need for it before this time. So we were all writing and inventing our own software, which is really fun for a technologist, but also when you're doing new stuff, you gotta make sure you get it right because nobody likes to see it fail. And yeah. so the, 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 the big mindset change was we don't need, it's not the elimination of humans. It's just that we don't need as many humans in the middle. And as you can imagine, this is a big, huge culture change because if you had a seat on the exchange and you were an active uh, member of the floor, and this was something, this was a legacy that was passed on in families. So parents would pass it to their children and would pass it to their grandchildren. This was going to be your career. Of course, you're going to work the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And all the technology was changing that. But again, it's not that the floor, that people disappear from the floor. Of course, that didn't happen at all. We see it uh, on the news all the time. There's plenty of people on the floor, just much less need for humans because so many of the transactions are handled by computer stock and computers and humans uh, kind of support that as opposed to be in the middle of it. And that was the big cultural change to make that happen. As you, as you can imagine, some people said, and I remember not, not only at our exchange, but other exchanges too, we can come up with technology to make humans even more performant and be, you, you, that's great, but you will never make them as fast as a computer that can right. do 100,000 trades a second. You will never, yeah. you'll never, that'll never happen. And so let, let's, instead of fighting progress that you won't be able to resist, let's embrace it 
And there's an old expression, I think Alan Kay said this many years ago, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And we were determined to invent the future. And that was the best way to deal with it. So how do you, I mean, you need to be at the cutting edge of this technology because it needs to be done right, but then getting people on board actually using it is a whole other world of work. And so, you know, suddenly shifting people into learning mode, as you know, I wanted to talk about on this show of getting people to embrace the technology. And for me, this is the place where storytelling has its greatest function. You know, there's level one, which is convincing executives to make a giant investment, a giant shift and understand the ramifications of and the consequences of their decision-making. But step two is now getting a host of users, some of whom were incredibly belligerent toward the shift. I know, I remember seeing the protests and the buttons on, on brokers' lapels, right? <laughs> on traders' lapels on the floor with you know, like the big line that says no automation going through it. I can't remember some of the slogans anymore, but I mean, there, were, there was a concerted protest against some of these technology shifts, if I remember correctly. So what's the story being told to get people on board? Well, you know, Susan, part of the, the um, job and being an effective advocate for these changes is, and I, and I know you'll agree with this 100%, you have to be a good listener and you have to. Mm. Step one of great storytelling. I always say it, that's step one, be you a know, great listener. Exactly. And I, you know, I can have a strong opinion on where I think things should go, but I know it's my opinion and I know I'm biased and I try and check myself all the time, but it's hard to do that for yourself, but you do the best you can. And so you want to listen to others. You want to listen to their concerns. You want to listen to their suggestions for improvements. The answer is lots of good answers can come from the most unlikely places. When I'd have these conversations, I'd say, you're looking at me as I'm the bringer of the new technology and I'm disrupting, but don't, it's not, it's not me. Because no. I used to tell people, if I didn't exist, Look at the marketplace. Look at the competitive landscape. It's all around us. We don't have a choice. So we can pretend that it's not happening. We can think it's, it's going to be a fad. And this, this whole internet way of thinking is going to disappear in a couple of years. I wouldn't bet on it, but it could happen, but I wouldn't bet on it. So assuming that it's not going to go away and it's only going to get more intense, what do we need to do in order to jump on the bandwagon uh, as opposed to just resist and, and hope that our resistance will be uh, productive. And so, and, and, and this is an old thing, you know, we talk about the willing and able matrix. And so I went to almost everybody, at least in the technology space, and I said, if you're willing to make the change, but you need some training or need to think of new things, whether it's technology, we will be happy to work with you. That's great. If you're not willing to make the change for whatever reasons, you, you just, you don't want to go, you don't want to sail on the ship. You don't want to do what we're doing here. It's not the place you want to be anymore. You're still a wonderful person. This just may not be the place for you anymore. We will give you every chance to succeed. But if you don't want to, then, then that's okay. Then you need to, maybe perhaps you should go someplace else where you'll feel happier because everyone should be as happy as they can be. And if life's too long and we work too hard to be unhappy. And so we, you know, we had people that said, I don't want to learn anything new. I know what I know. And I want to use, use that same technology for the same the next 20 years. I said, what, what technologists thinks that way. Technology changes so quickly in almost in, in weeks and months, there's new technologies. That's so right. to do the same for the next 20 years, there are jobs like that, but we probably won't have too many like that here. And so people have to make choices, but if you're willing to come along for this exciting future, it'll be hard work. It, I sometimes I used to describe it as an extreme sport because the demands were so exacting and how good we had to be every minute of every trading day. But it'll be a fantastic journey. It'll be very satisfying. It'll, it'll help this organization. It'll be look great, great on your resume. All these great things. We will help you come along for the journey. You just have to want to come along with us and tell us what you need and we'll listen and we'll help as much as we can. And that's what we, that's what we tried to do. And, you know, and the, the whole concept of culture, I used to go around and say, and, and I see this in many organizations, what exactly is our culture today and what would we like it to be? And it's got to be explicit. Because many times, and you'd be surprised, many CEOs have said to me, well, people will just come here and they'll just get it. And it's like, no, they, if you say they'll get it, that means that the distribution will be kind of asymmetric. It will take a long time for people to understand and uh, you won't get the results you want. Let's be more explicit about where we're coming from, all the good things we want to make sure we say, because 
uh, good cultural attributes you can't uh, turn around or develop overnight. You should treasure them and you should, you should elevate them. And let's figure out the things we don't want to do anymore. And let's talk about the things, the new things we want to do. And that'll be a statement of culture. And we'll, we'll broadcast to everyone. We'll ask for feedback. And that will be our, our operating model going forward. And, you know, then people understand what they're signing up for, what the mission of the organization is, what their role in is, is in it. That's really important. How they're going to be assessed, if they're doing a good job or not. And, and when you lay all those things out, most people can get excited about the future. And even though then it's uncertain and risky and they're out of their comfort zone, all the things that happen with innovation and change, you paint as good a picture to your point about storytelling. You tell the best stories about the future that you can to get people excited and enthused. Uh, you don't make false promises, but you get you, you sound optimistic. And it, you, a lot of people will come along because they, they, they realize it's a journey worth taking. Yeah, you know, this is it's such a critical skill. And as I'm thinking about all the other CIOs who are out there thinking about implementing change, especially those that can lead to a reduction in headcount, right? I speak to many software companies that are selling to chief security officer or a chief information officer who are selling on the basis that you'll probably need half the team you have now. And that sounds good to the hyper-efficient, productive, productivity-seeking startup that's trying to worm its way into a large corporate setting. But to a CIO who's often judged on power internally based on, I command this number of people, I command this size budget, I command this much bandwidth of you know, the mental power of, this, of the CEO, um, a reduction in headcount feels like a deflating balloon in some cases. And so painting a picture, I often say CIOs have to paint a picture of the future the rest of us can't see yet. And so is it also part of this discussion about redeployment or is the human story, it's time, I, I can still remember going to an ashram in upstate New York and a guru, someone had asked the question, you know, if there's a mosquito flying around in my, in my bedroom at night, is it, is it really karmically negative to kill the mosquito before he bites me? And, you know, the monk was making a joke, but he kind of said, you know, sometimes we think about those mosquitoes and just helping them, helping them attain their next rebirth a little bit more quickly, <laughs> which one of the joys of reincarnation, I suppose you're going to come back around one more time. But I, I, I laugh because I wonder if it's also part of the discussion of, you know, this isn't the place you were meant to be. This chapter is coming to an end for you, but there's a better place for you. Even if you were willing to embrace the technology, there's simply not enough seats at the table anymore because the robots are taking over those seats. Yeah, and that, that's and you know that goes back to our my, my comment about empathy and every human deserves to be treated with dignity, mm. uh, no matter what their disposition is or what their skill set is. We're all humans, and we should uh, treat each other with the greatest amount of respect. And so, to the best of your ability to do that, you should try and do that. And yes, to your to your point, in the best scenario, when we're making all these changes, we'd like to say that our revenues are going to go so high we can use even more people. And that's a great outcome if you can do that. And not, that doesn't, that's not often the case, but sometimes it is. Uh, case number two is, yes, you know what? The job you're doing is either going to be minimized or it's going to go away because of all this automation, but that's going to free you up to do more important things. Maybe something you could, uh, you have been doing all along, you're going to be able to spend more time on. Maybe something we'll need some training for. So it creates new opportunities and that sounds exciting. And then the third one is, and it's probably a mix of all these things. The third one is, you know what? we don't need as many people to run the same organization. And some people will uh, have to leave because of that. Uh, it's unfortunate and we'll do the best we can to make it as, as acceptable as possible, even though it's not an outcome that the people would like, but it's inevitable. And when people say, well, why do we have to do that? And I explain to people, because if we don't do that and our costs are too high and our inefficiency is too great, then the competition will take advantage of that because it's a very competitive market. The competition will take advantage of that, and that will affect everyone here. Everyone that works here will suffer because of that. Our revenues will decline, and it could uh, impact our company and, and each and every one of us. So we have to do something now 
to prepare ourselves to be the best company we can going forward. And yes, that will, that will necessitate some changes. We'll do the best job we can in helping out those changes, but that is what the future is going to look like. And to your point, there's going to be much more of that in the future across all kinds of industries in terms of automation supplanting workers. And I, I like the model of, of uh, collaborative robotics where robots and humans work side by side and that humans benefit from the, the things that robots do really well and, ro and the humans fill in the gaps that robots can't do. And, and by the way, I say this about the exchange floor all the time. Sometimes people say to me, well, why can't, why not just have 100% computers talking to computers? Why do you have a, why is there a floor, whether it's our exchange or other exchanges around the world, why is there a floor at all? And there's several reasons for it. But one reason that I tout more than ever, and this is my belief, even though I'm a strict, I'm a very deep technologist, I believe in, in the, the human capacity that far exceeds any robot that we're going to ever invent, at least in the, in the future I can see. And that is, we are really better at dealing with uncertainty than any robot uh, or any piece of AI that you know about. And that is, and sometimes when the markets are tumultuous in a, in a way that we don't understand, all the analytic models we can build don't know what to do with that because they were calibrated on stuff that happened before. And now this is brand new uncharted territory. And what typically happens is they make errors because they don't know how to deal with it. Or in the trading world, the people behind the scenes that are uh, the, the owners of these models turn them off and mm -hmm. say, you know what? I got to let them cool down because this is something weird going on here. I can make a lot of money, but I could also lose a lot of money. And still we figure out what's going on, we need to stop. And humans are really good in those uncertain times, even though we can't process as fast as a, as a computer to figure out what's going on and take the next best possible course of action. And that's one of, of, of several reasons why humans are important in these critical decision loops, because they're important to make the decisions that computers aren't yet uh, reliable enough to make, especially in very critical situations or very uncertain situations. Right. And we still need to analyze the results of their work so that we can find creative new uses for them too. That is the power of the human brain is the creativity that lies within it. And so, you know, you made the shift from, you know, transforming one of the America's most ancient institutions into a digital powerhouse that it is today. But you also decided to transform some of these creative brains that we're talking about at the university level and making the decision to become a professor. And so I'm, I'm really curious about this because, you know, you and I, before we started, before we hit the record button, we're talking about the, the real power of the human, like that creative side of the brain is to constantly be learning. We are the original robots, right? Sure. We are the ones who are constantly programming. How critical is it for our innovative audience, you know, to think about the process of lifelong learning? Yeah, so I, I feel very strongly about this, and you're right, we were talking about this before we started, and I think that lifelong learning or continuous education or whatever, however people like to describe it, is critical, and again, I'm biased because, it, because I talk about STEM as opposed to you know, the humanities, because that's my field, but I, because the, the obsolescence of the knowledge in the STEM fields is so rapid, depending on who you talk to, some of the things that are current today will be I don't want to say totally obsolete, but kind of to get cobwebs on them in six months to a couple of years. And we constantly need to be retraining ourselves in order to be on top of our game. And so the, again, as a technologist, that's exciting because you get to learn new things and explore new areas and try new things out. But it's also uh, a burden in, in some regard that you need to be training, whether you train yourself, you know, your own initiative, whether you go to formal degree programs or certificate programs, like uh, many of the universities have done, unlike ours, to refresh your skills. I point out to people that our careers are going to be longer because the, through the advent of better nutrition and better, me, better medical sciences, we're going to be living longer and we're going to be living better. Our lives are going to be a higher quality because of uh, a better health care and that sort of stuff. And so our careers are going to be longer. And if you're in technology and if some people are going to have careers that will last 60 years, there's a lot of learning that needs to take place in, in order to stay on top of your game in the technology field. And it's incumbent upon us to, do, to take the initiative because we, we ourselves should look out for ourselves first and foremost, but all the educational institutions, whether they be universities or colleges or community colleges and you know other, the, the, the Courseras and Udacities of the world, we all have a role to play in helping people across the globe 
get uh, stay on top. You learn new things and stay on top of their current things, so they can always be the the great contributors uh, that they need to be. And yeah. and so you know, and you talk about storytelling. I you know I I realized the importance of that even before I called it storytelling. I realized the importance of that and. My most recent degree, most of my degrees are from the uh, 80s and, uh, and 90s, but my most recent degree was just awarded last year. I got an MFA in comedy screenwriting. And wow. My, and why did I do that? I did that because I thought it would be fun, but, and also I thought it would be exercising an, another part of my brain that uh, apart from all the analytic and scientific side, but most important, I wanted to learn how to tell stories better especially in a visual medium, because I realize how important that is in everything you do. Right. So important. Yeah. You and I both, we're, we're comedy, comedy aficionados. I do a little stand up on the side. You know, they always put me on stage at around midnight, 1230. I, my set, I always say has a three drink minimum, not a two drink minimum to get through it. But there is, there is a uh, quality of putting yourself out there in a way that doesn't happen at work and that really exposes you when you decide to put your creativity on the line, as opposed to just your smarts, it's a whole other set of vulnerability too. And it's a whole different, it's a different skill set, but it's a different level of vulnerability when you expose traits that you haven't spent the last 50 years honing to suddenly expose kind of like this fresh new skin, you know, it's like after you get your cast off, after you break your arm or something, like everything just feels really exposed, but it's electrifying. And I think if we think about the technology changes that have occurred, let's say since the space shuttle, since the advent of the iPhone, and that that's just accelerating, if we're all going to be in the workforce longer than we ever anticipated, what other tech, we can't even fathom the technology changes. I mean, people are, are going on vacation to space, right? Even if it's for a couple of hours, but I mean, that's becoming a day trip. So when you think about that, I can only imagine what our leisure time, much less what our work time and our creative time is going to look like with tech. And, and, and there's a great challenge with challenge comes opportunity in the in the educational space. I'm focused on higher education and it's a challenge mm. for all of uh, the institutions of higher learning. And we, we got a lot of lessons during the pandemic, how the good things about remote learning and the things that we wish were better about remote learning. And I love getting up in front of a classroom. I, I, I'm not a stand up comic, although <laughs> I love to, but I, I, I did a year of improv at Second City. But, I, wow. but I, I love getting up in front of a classroom and engaging the students. And to your point about technology, students, of course, more than ever, have so many distractions. They have their cell phones. They have their laptops. You're trying to convey information. If you're exciting and engaging and informative, you have their attention. And if you lose them for a little bit, they're on their cell phone, whether they're texting or checking their mail or shopping at Amazon. And you can say, you know, get rid of the electronic devices. We're going to ban them. That's one approach. But the better approach is rather than, again, this is not a, there's a little bit of a parallel here competing with the machines. How can you do a better job as a human competing with the machines and remove and minimize that distraction because they want to listen to you because you have engaged them and because they're learning something and then they minimize the distraction of those devices. And that's a challenge for all educators and some are doing better than others. And I think that's part of our future. And people talk about, you know, augmented reality and virtual reality and how that gets into the classroom. There's a lot of cool demos. I don't know if we're even close to that being a, a, a big a, a advantage yet, but the future, we'll see what happens in the future. But all of these things we want to put together so we can put together the best educational environment for students, whether they're right in front of us, which is my preference, or whether they're a thousand miles away over a screen. And we want to make sure that we're sensitive to the needs of everybody that wants to learn. Fantastic. And that that's ultimately being the best human we can be is being more interesting and more compelling than the robots that live in our phones, mm -hmm. right? And the automation that lives in our phones. Okay, so it's come to this time of the hour where I ask you our critical hot seat questions here at Innovation Storytellers. So greatest innovation in the history of mankind. What are you, what are you choosing, Steve? Wow, um, the greatest innovation. Or you can give us your top three. Okay. You prefer. The, the, Don't box yourself in. Yeah, that's right. I could be thinking about that way beyond this this uh, uh, episode. You know, I'd have to say one of them is the the internet, but 
the internet, sometimes people use the internet and the World Wide Web as synonyms. Or for those of us who know, the internet was developed way before the World Wide Web, never with the intended purpose that we got now. But this ability to connect everyone in the world, billions of people in the world, and a mouse click away is a, both a, a um, downsize that comes with it for sure, as we all uh, uh, well uh, know too well, but so much, so much potential for uh, engaging people uh, and communicating with people and educating people and learning from each other. Yeah. So that's a fantastic invention. And, and then there's probably uh, lots of things I could cite in the biotech world that are going to improve our lives going forward uh, in, in improving the quality of our life and in, in combating diseases that maybe we thought we would never be able to uh, get ahead of and we will be able to and that that's going to be a huge boost and, and and since my field of study in chemistry is biochemistry I'm very much sympathetic and attuned to that and you know th those are I, that's what I talk about our, our connectedness via the internet yep. and also advances in medical science okay innovation team you would have loved to have been on or mm -hmm. would like to be on you know what uh, I, and, I I've always had a fascination for programs, and th this could be NASA. It could, a year, a few years ago, it would have been NASA. To maybe today, it's NASA or SpaceX or Blue Origin. But I, I, and I always use this as an example for students and anybody that wants to listen to my stories. When you're launching a vehicle, and I, I tell people there is no, there is no Plan B. I mean, yes, you have fallback systems and stuff like that, but you can't send a crew out to repair it because there's no, there's no SUV that you can send out into space. So you got to get it right the first time and you're planning it for years. You're spending billions of dollars and it's got to be right the first time. And sometimes they're unmanned. And so therefore it's, I want to say just, you just risk losing a lot of expensive machinery and having a project fail. And sometimes there are people there and human lives are at stake and you've got to get it right. And I said, to me, that would be again, challenging and exciting because to, to make sure that you're on a project where the, the classic expression, failure is not an option. Right. And yet you got, you got to launch the thing. You can't you know, study it one more time to make sure. And so I always use that as an example of that's kind of the ultimate in terms of testing your ability to create uh, systems, both infrastructure and software and all that, that has to perform otherwise or very So serious. like Mars Rover, Steve, is that like a team you might want to be on? You know what? I would like to do that. I don't know. Sometimes I think I would like to travel to Mars, knowing that, uh, as Elon Musk uh, reminds people, it may be a one-way trip. I yep. don't really want it to be a one-way trip, but I sure would like to be involved in that. Cool. And my last question is, if you had the ability to innovate something or invent something that doesn't yet exist, like something you'd love to see in the world or something that drives you absolutely crazy that needs to be fixed, what is that thing? You know what, what a, a field of study that uh, is relatively new that a lot of people are talking about is the whole field of uh, quantum computing, mm. that we're going to enter new, we're going to discover new possibilities and that we can do with quantum computers is still not quite practical, but, but they will be. And I think that the things that opening up, I, what, again, what I used to say, and as I said earlier on, as long as you don't have to uh, exceed the laws, of, you can kind of do anything you want. And then people will challenge me where they're trying, you know, we have a little bit of a give and take. They'll say, well, you're talking about classical physics. What about quantum physics? I said, that's a whole new world. And that opens up all kinds of possibilities right. uh, in terms of um, understanding the world around us with computing speeds and power that we can't, we can hardly imagine today. And, and aiding uh, things that we do in every walk of life and hopefully improving it as, as opposed to the other way. And I think there's all kinds of possibilities there, including, and again, this is a little bit far-fetched, but including, uh, you know, the Star Trek thing of teleporting people, you know, disassembling them here and sending them over there. Theoretically, that's possible. And it's like, I, I would, I think that would be a very cool thing to do to be able to send yourself across the, the galaxy, assuming that you had a receiving station somewhere at the speed of light, just taking apart all the information that defines you and reassembling it somewhere else. Yeah. Now, how useful that would be, I'm not really sure, but it's a very cool thing. I think this leads back to my reincarnation experience from previously. You just might wind up as a squirrel, but I will say it's probably the most popular response to that question on this show is the Star Trek transponder of getting from one point to another. Well, thank you so much, Steve. I hope we'll be able to beam you up here again in the future. Thank you so much for being on the show. How can people get in touch? They can, they, they can look me up on LinkedIn. My information's all there and my contact information. If anybody wants to engage me, I'm always happy to hear from people. That's right. Or you could just enlist and matriculate at DePaul University and um, sign up for a class with Professor Steve Rubinow. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for having me here.